So what we've got now is uh, some idea about the rules that we can use when we're manipulating Boolean functions. Uh, and I want to take you to the process of manipulating these functions and sort of walk through the, um, the requirements and, and sort of specifications of what make Boolean functions a little bit different when it comes to uh, doing these kind of manipulations. Uh, so this is the stuff that's in the notes and you can look at this stuff on your own leisure, but I do want to walk through it just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, Boolean functions, just like any other kind of algebra, have variables and they have um, operators and they have constants, which in this case could be one or zero. Um, everything could be one or zero. That's sort of what makes Boolean special. So if we're doing stuff that's, um, uh, the variables are one and zero, one or zero, the uh, result can be one or zero, right? Then the idea is that if we build a collection of variables and operators, possibly constants, uh, then they will give us a particular value for every possible input combination. And then when we look at these input combinations, we'll see what those values can be. Just like with regular algebra, there is an order of operations that we have to follow. Uh, with Boolean algebra, the order of operations is a little bit simplistic. So traditional high school algebra has uh, uh, parentheses first and then exponents and then division and multiplication and then addition and subtraction. Uh, this is because exponents have priority over division and multiplication, which then has priority over addition and subtraction. In a Boolean algebra, we don't have any of those priorities. All we have is not, and, or. And basically, all you've got is parentheses first, always. Uh, not is first before anything else because it's a unary operator. It only operates on one thing. Uh, but then and and or basically have the same precedence. Now, by convention, we do say that and has precedence, uh, but only in the way we write expressions. So if we have x or y, z, we do the y, z first, and then we or it with the x. But that should actually be written as x or y, z like this, um, if you want to be really clear. So be very careful about this, uh, because and and or are actually co-equal. So we can look at the way that these functions are written, and we can indicate... Um, we can uh, indicate the information that's contained in that function in a few different ways. Uh, we can indicate that information as a written algebraic function like this. We can also draw it as a circuit. This is identical information. And you can see that, right? Because the x or y bar z in this function, we do the y bar first, right? Because not happens first. And then we do the and, because that's our convention. So y bar and z, that's this, y bar and z. And then the result is ORed with x, and we get the function f. So whatever the result is going to be, the circuit tells us the same information as the function. Now, the truth table is just an enumeration of all the possible input combinations and what the output will be for that function. So because we have three inputs, we have exactly eight possibilities for the inputs to this function, 0, 0, 0 through 1, 1, 1. This is 1, this is 7. Uh, and so we can see what the output is going to be based on those uh, based on those possible input combinations. So we can actually prove this to ourselves. And there's a slide later on that talks about proofs. We can prove this to ourselves by looking at the individual terms here, uh, x and then y bar z, and showing that they are in fact equivalent to what our truth table says the function output should be. So if we look at this in this way, uh, we can start by implementing y bar z first, and we can do that here. We can say y bar, and we'll just see what y bar is. Well, here's y down here. Y bar is just the opposite. So it would be 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. So if y is 0, y bar is 1, that's pretty straightforward. Then we can look at what, uh, y bar z would be. To do that, we take the y bar and we're going to and it with z. And that means it can only be one where both inputs are one. So if either y bar or z is a zero, that term y bar z has to be zero. That's our definition of and. And so we can look at y bar and say if it's zero, then the output has to be zero. That term has to be zero. We can look at z. Z is here. Zero has to be zero. 0, that's already a 0. 0 has to be 0. That one is 0. So the only place where y bar z is 1 is if y bar is 1 and at the same time z is 1. And it only happens twice.
in those two places. Then we can look at taking that term, <clears throat> which looks like this, and oring it with x. So uh, if we take y bar z or x, we can see what that should be. Now that's going to be 1 when either of those two things is 1. Either y bar z is 1 or x is 1. Because that's what or is. Or is 1 if any of them are 1. And the only time or is 0 is if both are 0. So if y bar z, which is the one we're looking at here, is 1, well, then the output is 1. And if x is 1, here's all the cases where x is 1, then that term is also 1. In all the other places, they're both 0. y bar z is 0, x is 0, here, here, and here. And so if you look at that, that is in fact what our function is listed as. Uh, so we've just proved to ourselves, taking from the function itself and looking at the circuit diagram, that this truth table fully enumerates every possibility. We could say if x is 0, y is 1, and z is 1, we expect the output to be 0. Now, when we do our circuit simulations using our software we learn in the lab, we can actually plug that in. We can plug a 0 and a 1 and a 1, and we can see what the end result is going to be. Uh, and we expect it to be a zero. Now we can actually trace that out on the circuit as well. This one will become a zero. These and will only be one if both are one. Uh, this one is a zero. That's a one, so this has to be a zero. That's a zero. Zero or zero is zero. And so we've shown that for that particular input combination at least, the truth table is correct. So this is different ways of representing the same information and the information we're representing is this function of three variables that is true in those five circumstances and false in the other three. This is the kind of thing we're looking at. Uh, and we can show that in a few different ways. Uh, here, these notations that I've given show the situations where y bar z is true, and that happens when y is zero and z is one. And the situations where x is true, and we can show that in those situations, y bar z or x, those are the terms that are available. So we've talked about the identities already. There's a video on these identities, and so I'm not going to spend too much time on them, except to remind you of some of these names. I did mess up the names in one of these videos. This is the one that's correct. Commutative means you can do it in any order. X or Y is the same as Y or X. Associative means if you have more than one layer, you can do those in any order as long as they are the same operator. So X or Y or Z is the same as X or Y or Z. Uh, and then distribution is the one that we're used to, although as we'll see in Boolean, distribution works in two ways. And the OR version of Boolean of distribution, this is the AND version of distribution, the OR version of distribution looks a little weird, but pay attention to it because it is in fact true. This is the full table of these identities. Have a look at this. Uh, the in If you have the textbook, Mano, uh, Figure 2.6 has this list as well. And I've left this one blank uh, because this is the absorption rule for AND. And it's worth just trying it out for yourself to make sure you know what the absorption rule for AND is. And you can prove it to yourself that it works. Um, each of these are set up as duals. So the OR version and the AND version. Uh, the annihilator is where you get rid of information. The identity is where you preserve the same information. Idempotent means you operate on a variable and you get that variable back again x or x is x, x and x is x. And this will be really useful when we're doing our simplifications because we will be able to duplicate any term. Any term, we can actually make multiple copies of it without changing the logical value. We'll see how that works. Uh, absorption is where you have a term by itself or with a subterm, which is a term that is more specified. Uh, and that just gets rid of that term. It gets absorbed into the bigger term. And you might be able to figure out what the uh, and version of that is. And then commutivity, distributivity, associativity, and De Morgan, as were in the previous videos. So have a look at those. Uh, you can also do it with multiple input variables, multiple input functions, as you'll see. Uh, this will all become more clear as we go. Uh, but the definitions for AND and OR, again, as a reminder, AND is 1 if and only if all inputs are 1. And OR is 0 if and only if all inputs are 0. Uh, so these are the formulas for those multiple input gates, which again, you can put in your logical uh, simulation software. Uh, we can take these identities to do proofs. Uh, the simplest way to do a proof is like we did just a minute ago, where we actually compute out the truth table 
and show that for every possible combination of inputs, for every possible input case, the output is the same. And this is a simple proof that De Morgan is true, X bar or Y bar is the same as X, Y, all bar. And we, we provide that proof by looking at X bar and Y bar separately first, and then looking at X, Y together and then barring that. And we see that they're the same. Now it's worth noting here uh, that there are a couple of different ways to indicate an inverse uh, or a complement. Uh, the, the traditional way to do that is with a bar over the top, but when you're typing stuff out on your computer, that can be a bit challenging to do. So we can also say X prime, which is the opposite of X, although that gets confusing if you look at calculus. Uh, the other that we see and is actually used in your software is tilde X. These all mean the same thing. And so if you're typing this stuff out in your assignments, use whatever you're familiar with um, so that we know which one you're, uh, you're going to use. So when you're doing manipulation of a Boolean function using these rules, uh, we can use these rules for lots of different things. We can use them to show that two expressions are equivalent. That's your proofs. Uh, we can use them to simplify a given expression. I can give you a big, long, complicated expression, and then your job would be to either reduce the number of literals logic levels or operations. And there's lots of um, situations where you'd want to do all these kind of sim um, simplifications. A uh, literal, by the way, I think this is where we define it. A literal is just a single instance of a variable or an input. So if we have, for example, uh, a and f equals a or a or a prime, that has three literals, but we can simplify it because we know already that a or a is the same as a, that's the idempotent rule. So this is f equals a or a prime. So that already has one fewer literal. So it's simpler. Uh, and we can simplify this even further. We can say a or a is one. There's only one situation where, or I guess the other way of saying that is in all situations, either a or a prime will be true. If a is zero, a prime will be one. And that's true. If a is one, a or a prime is true. So this is just equal to one. It's always true, which means we have no literals. So we've reduced the number of literals using our simplification rules. Uh, we also want to be able to reduce the number of logic levels. This means uh, how many logic gates a signal has to propagate through before it gets to the output. Uh, and we'll see that in some of the examples that we see later. And the number of operations. Each operation sort of corresponds to one gate, as we saw before. And so if we can reduce the number of operations, we might have a simpler circuit. And often we'll see that these things are in, um, in their trade-offs. They're, they're sort of in competition. You can reduce the number of operations, but you might then have to increase the number of literals or logic levels. And as you do these simplification examples, you'll see how all that stuff works. Uh, so a few examples. I'm going to skip these in this and we can do these actually in class uh, proofs examples why simplify because it makes our circuit more efficient have a look at this stuff and you'll see uh, more examples more examples and so we'll work on those examples in class uh, do come prepared with those examples so that you can uh, work through them in class and we'll do a few more that aren't here uh, and then we'll start up again uh, in the next video looking at some theory some names of some of these things and sort of why it works the way it does